Book Three, Chapter Two of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, The Franciscan Confessor, The Soul in the Burying Ground, The Shoemaker of Hagenau, The Students, Myconius, Conversation with Tetzel stratagem by a gentleman conversation of the wise and of the people a minor of schneeberg but let us look at some of the scenes which then took place in germany during this sale of the pardon of sins for we here meet with anecdotes which by themselves alone give a picture of the times as we proceed with our narrative we deem it best to let men speak for themselves at magdeburg tetzel refused to absolve a wealthy female unless she would pay him one hundred florins in advance she consulted her ordinary confessor who was a franciscan god replied he gives the remission of sins freely and does not sell it however he begged her not to tell tetzel what advice he had given her but the merchant having somehow or other heard of the words so injurious to his interest exclaimed such an adviser deserves to be banished or burned tetzel rarely found men enlightened enough and still more rarely bold enough to resist him for the most part he had a good market from the superstitious crowd he had erected the red cross of indulgences at zwickau and the good parishioners had hastened to make the money which was to deliver them chink on the bottom of the chest he was going away with a well-filled purse the evening before his departure the chaplains and their attendants applied to him for a farewell entertainment the request was reasonable but how was it possible to comply with it the money was already counted and sealed up the next morning he orders the large bell to be rung crowds hastened to the church everyone thinking that something extraordinary must have happened as the station was closed i had resolved said he to depart this morning but last night was awoke by groans on listening i found they came from the burying ground alas it was a poor soul calling and entreating me instantly to deliver it from the torment by which it was consumed i have therefore remained one day more in order to stir up the compassion of christian hearts in favour of this unhappy soul i am willing myself to be the first to give and whosoever does not follow my example will deserve damnation what heart would not have responded to such an appeal who knew moreover whose soul it was that was crying in the burying ground the people contributed freely and tetzel gave the chaplains and their attendants a jovial entertainment defraying the expense by the offerings which he had received in favour of the soul of zwickau the indulgence merchants had fixed their station at hagenau in 1517 a shoemaker's wife taking advantage of the authority of the instruction of the commissary-general had contrary to the will of her husband procured a letter of indulgence and paid a gold florin for it she died shortly after the husband not having caused mass to be said for the repose of her soul the curate charged him with contempt of religion and the judge of hagenau summoned him to appear the shoemaker put his wife's indulgence in his pocket and repaired to the court is your wife dead asked the judge yes replied he what have you done for her i have buried her body and commended her soul to god but have you caused a mass to be said for the salvation of her soul i have not it was unnecessary she entered heaven at the moment of her death how do you know that here is the proof so saying he takes the indulgence out of his pocket and the judge in presence of the curate reads in as many words that the woman who received it would not enter purgatory but go straight to heaven if the reverend curate maintains that a mass is still necessary 
my wife has been cheated by our most holy father the pope if she was not cheated then it is the reverend curate who is cheating me this was unanswerable and the accused was acquitted thus the good sense of the people did justice to these pious frauds one day when tetzel was preaching at leipzig and introducing into his sermons some of those stories of which we have given a sample two students feeling quite indignant rose up and left the church exclaiming it is impossible for us to listen longer to the drolleries and puerilities of this monk one of them it is said was young camerarius afterwards the intimate friend of melancthon and his biographer but of all the young men of the period he on whom tetzel made the strongest impression unquestionably was myconius afterwards celebrated as a reformer and historian of the reformation he had received a christian education his father a pious man of franconia was wont to say to him my son pray frequently for all things are freely given to us by god alone the blood of christ added he is the only ransom for the sins of the whole world oh my son were there only three men that could be saved by the blood of christ believe and believe with confidence that thou art one of the three it is an insult to the blood of the saviour to doubt if it saves then cautioning his son against the traffic which was beginning to be established in germany the roman indulgences said he to him are nets which fish for money and deceive the simple the forgiveness of sins and eternal life are not things for sale at the age of thirteen frederick myconius was sent to the school of annaberg to finish his studies shortly after tetzel arrived in the town and remained in it for two years the people flocked in crowds to his sermon there is no other method exclaimed tetzel in his voice of thunder there is no other method of obtaining eternal life than the satisfaction of works but this satisfaction is impossible for man and therefore all he can do is purchase it from the roman pontiff when tetzel was about to quit annaberg his addresses became more urgent soon exclaimed he in threatening tone soon i will take down the cross shut the gate of heaven and quench the lustre of that sun of grace which is now shining in your eyes then resuming the gentle accent of persuasion now said he is the accepted time now is the day of salvation then raising his voice anew the pontifical stentor who was addressing the inhabitants of a rich mineral district loudly exclaimed bring your money burghers of annaberg contribute largely in behalf of the indulgences and your mines and your mountains will be filled with pure silver in conclusion he declared that at pentecost he would distribute his letters to the poor gratuitously and for the love of god young myconius being among the number of tetzel's hearers felt an eager desire to avail himself of this offer going up to the commissaries he said to them in latin i am a poor sinner and i need a gratuitous pardon the merchants replied those alone can have parts in the merits of jesus christ who lend a helping hand to the church in other words who give money what is the meaning then said myconius of those promises of free gift which are posted up on the walls and the doors of the churches give at least a shilling said tetzel's people who had gone to their master and interceded with him for the young man but without effect i am not able only sixpence i have not even so much the dominicans then began to fear that he wished to entrap them listen they said to him we will make you a present of the sixpence the young man raising his voice in indignation answered i want no indulgences that are purchased if i wished to purchase i would only have to sell one of my school books i want a free pardon given purely for the love of god and you will have to give account to god for having allowed the salvation of a soul to be lost for a sixpence 
"'Who sent you to entrap us?' exclaimed the merchants. "'Nothing but the desire of receiving the grace of God "'could have tempted me to appear before such mighty lords,' "'replied the young man, and withdrew. "'I was much grieved,' said he, "'at being sent thus pitilessly away, "'but I still felt within myself a comforter "'who told me that there was a God in heaven "'who, without money and without price, "'pardons repenting sinners for the love of his Son, Jesus Christ.' As I was taking leave of those people, I melted into tears and sobbed, praying, O oh God, since these men have refused me the forgiveness of my sins because I had no money to pay for it, do thou, O oh Lord, have pity on me, and forgive my sins in pure mercy. I went to my lodging, and, taking up my crucifix, which was lying on my desk, laid it on my chair, and prostrated myself before it. I cannot describe what I felt. I asked God to be my father, and to do with me whatsoever he pleased. I felt my nature changed, converted, and transformed. What formerly delighted me now excited my disgust. To live with God, and please him, was my strongest, my only desire. Thus Tetzel himself contributed to the Reformation. By crying abuses he paved the way for a purer doctrine, and the indignation which he excited in a generous youth was one day to break forth mightily. We may judge of this by the following anecdote. A Saxon gentleman, who had heard Tetzel at Leipzig, felt his indignation aroused by his falsehoods, and going up to the monk asked him whether he had power to pardon the sins which were intended to be committed. Assuredly, replied Tetzel, I have full power from the Pope to do so. Well then, resumed the knight, there is one of my enemies on whom I should like to take a slight revenge, without doing him any deadly injury, and I will give you ten crowns in return for a letter of indulgence, which will completely acquit me. Tetzel made some objections. At last, however, they came to an agreement for thirty crowns. Soon after, the monk quits Leipzig. The gentleman, accompanied by his servants, waited for him in a wood between Jutterbock and Treblin, and, rushing out upon him, and giving him some blows with a stick, carried off the rich indulgence chest which the inquisitor had with him. Tetzel cries out, Robbery! and carries his complaint before the judges, but the gentleman shows the letter with Tetzel's own signature exempting him beforehand from all punishment. Duke George, who had at first been very angry, on seeing the document ordered the accused to be acquitted. This traffic everywhere occupied men's thoughts, and was everywhere talked of. It was the subject of conversation in castles, in academies, and at the firesides of the citizens, as well as in inns and taverns and all places of public resort. Opinions were divided, some believing and others expressing indignation. The sensible portion of the community rejected the whole system of indulgences with disgust. It was so contrary to scripture and to morality that all who had any knowledge of the Bible or any natural light condemned it in their hearts and only waited for a signal to declare their opposition to it. On the other hand, scoffers found ample materials for raillery. The people who had for many years been irritated by the misconduct of the priests and whom nothing but the fear of punishment induced to keep up a certain show of respect gave free vent to their hatred. Complaints and sarcasms were everywhere heard on the avarice of the clergy. Nor did they stop here. They even attacked the power of the keys and the authority of the sovereign pontiff. Why, said they, does not the Pope deliver all souls from purgatory at once, from a holy charity, and in consideration of the sad misery of these souls, seeing he delivers so great a number for the love of perishable money and of the cathedral of St. Peter? Why do feasts and anniversaries of the dead continue to be celebrated? 
why does not the pope restore or allow others to resume the benefices and prebends which have been founded in favour of the dead since it is now useless and even reprehensible to pray for those whom indulgences have for ever delivered what kind of new holiness in god and the pope is this from a love of money to enable a wicked profane man to deliver a pious soul beloved of the lord from purgatory rather than deliver it themselves gratuitously from love and because of its great wretchedness the gross and immoral conduct of the traffickers in indulgences was much talked of in paying carriers for transporting them with their goods the innkeepers with whom they lodge or any one who does any piece of work for them they give a letter of indulgence for four five or any number of souls as the case may be in this way the diplomas of salvation were current in inns and in markets like bank bills or paper money bring bring said the common people is the head the belly the tail and the whole body of the sermon a miner of schneeberg meeting a seller of indulgences asked must we indeed give credit to what you have often said of the power of the indulgence and of the authority of the pope and believe it possible by throwing a penny into the box to ransom a soul from purgatory the merchant assured him it was true ah resumed the miner what an unmerciful man the pope must be for a paltry penny to leave a miserable soul so long crying in the flames if he has no ready money let him borrow some hundred thousand crowns and deliver all these people at once we poor folks will willingly pay him both the interest and the capital thus germany was weary of the shameful traffic which was going on in the midst of her and could no longer tolerate the impostures of these master swindlers of rome as luther calls them yet no bishop no theologian durst oppose their quackery and their fraud the minds of men were in suspense and asked whether god would not raise up some mighty man for the work which was required to be done this man nowhere appeared end of book three chapter two book three chapter three of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three leo x necessities of the pope albert his character favours the indulgences the franciscans and the dominicans the pope then on the pontifical throne was not a borgia but leo x of the illustrious house of medici he was able frank kind and gentle his address was affable his liberality without bounds and his morals superior to those of his court cardinal pallavicini however acknowledges that they were not altogether irreproachable to this amiable character he joined several of the qualities of a great prince he showed himself friendly to science and art the first italian comedies were represented in his presence and there are few of his day which he did not see performed he was passionately fond of music musical instruments resounded every day in his palace and he was often heard humming the airs which had been performed before him he was fond of magnificence and spared nothing when fates games theatricals presents or rewards were in question no court surpassed that of the sovereign pontiff in splendour and gaiety accordingly when it was learned that julian medicis was proposing to reside at rome with his young bride god be praised exclaimed cardinal bibliena the most influential counsellor of leo x the only thing we wanted was a female court a female court was necessary to complete the court of the pope to religious sentiment leo was completely a stranger his manners were so pleasing says sapi that he would have been perfect if he had had some acquaintance with religious matters and had been somewhat more inclined to piety which seldom if ever gave him any concern 
leo was greatly in want of money he had to provide for his immense expenditure supply all his liberalities fill the purse of gold which he daily threw to the people keep up the licentious exhibitions of the vatican satisfy the numerous demands of his relations and voluptuous courtiers give a dowry to his sister who had been married to prince sibo a natural son of pope innocent the eighth and meet the expenditure occasioned by his taste for literature arts and pleasure his cousin cardinal pucci as skilful in the art of hoarding as leo in that of lavishing advised him to have recourse to indulgences accordingly the pope published a bull announcing a general indulgence the proceeds of which were he said to be employed in the erection of the church of st peter that monument of sacerdotal magnificence in a letter dated at rome under the seal of the fisherman in november fifteen hundred and seventeen leo applies to his commissary of indulgences for one hundred and forty seven gold ducats to pay a manuscript of the thirty-third book of livy of all the uses to which he put the money of the germans this was doubtless the best still it was strange to deliver souls from purgatory in order to purchase a manuscript history of the wars of the roman people there was at this time in germany a young prince who might be regarded as in many respects a living image of leo x this was albert a younger brother of the elector joachim of brandenburg at twenty-four years of age he had been appointed archbishop and elector of mentz and of magdeburg and two years after made a cardinal albert had neither the virtues nor the vices which are often met with in the high dignitaries of the church young fickle worldly but not without some generous feelings he was perfectly aware of many of the abuses of catholicism and cared little for the fanatical monks by whom he was surrounded his equity disposed him in part at least to acknowledge the justice of what the friends of the gospel demanded in his secret heart he was not much opposed to luther capito one of the most distinguished reformers was long his chaplain counsellor and confidant albert regularly attended his sermons he did not despise the gospel says capito on the contrary he highly esteemed it and for a long time would not allow the monks to attack luther but he would have liked luther not to compromise him and to take good care while exposing the doctrinal errors and vices of the inferior clergy not to disclose the faults of bishops and princes in particular he was most anxious that his name should not be mixed up with the affair his confidant capito who had imposed upon himself as men often do in situations similar to his thus addressed luther look to the example of jesus christ and the apostles they rebuked the pharisees and the incestuous man of corinth but they never expressly named them you know not what is passing in the hearts of the bishops and perhaps there is more good in them than you suppose but the fickle and profane spirit of albert still more than the susceptibilities and fears of his self-love estranged him from the reformation affable clever handsome extravagant and wasteful delighting in the pleasures of the table in rich equipages splendid buildings licentious pleasures and literary society this young archbishop elector was in germany what leo x was at rome his court was one of the most magnificent in the empire and he was prepared to sacrifice to pleasure and grandeur all the sentiments of truth which perhaps might have insinuated themselves into his heart nevertheless his better convictions continued even to the last to exercise some degree of influence over him and he repeatedly gave indications of moderation and equity albert like leo was in want of money the fuggers rich merchants in augsburg had made him advances which he behoved to repay and hence though he had managed to secure two archbishoprics and a bishopric he was unable to pay rome for his pallium 
this ornament of white wool bespangled with black crosses and blessed by the pope who sent it to the archbishops as a token of their dignity cost them twenty-six or some say thirty thousand florins in order to obtain money albert naturally enough bethought himself of having recourse to the same methods as the pope he accordingly applied to him for the general farming of the indulgences or as they expressed it at rome of the sins of the germans the popes sometimes kept the indulgences in their own hands and at other times farmed them out in the same way as some governments still do gaming houses albert made an offer to leo to share the profits with him and leo in agreeing to the bargain stipulated for immediate payment of the pallium albert had been counting on paying it out of the indulgences and therefore applied anew to the fugas who thinking the security good agreed on certain conditions to make the advance required and were appointed bankers to the concern they were the bankers of the princes of this period and were afterwards made counts in return for the services which they had rendered the pope and the archbishop having thus by anticipation shared in the spoils of the good souls of germany the next matter was to select the persons who were to carry the affair into effect it was first offered to the franciscan order whose guardian was conjoined with albert but as it was already in bad odour with honest people these monks were not anxious to have anything to do with it the augustines who were more enlightened than the other religious orders would have been less inclined to undertake it the franciscans however being afraid of offending the pope who had just sent their chief de forli a cardinal's hat a hat which had cost this poor mendicant order thirty thousand florins the guardian deemed it more prudent not to refuse openly but at the same time threw all sorts of difficulties in albert's way they could never understand each other and accordingly when the proposal was made to the elector to undertake the whole charge he eagerly closed with it the dominicans on the other hand longed for a share in the general collection which was about to commence tetzel who was already famous in the trade hastened to mentz to offer his services to the elector in consideration of the talent which he had displayed in publishing the indulgences for the knights of the teutonic order of prussia and livonia his proposals were accepted and in this way the whole traffic passed into the hands of his order end of book three chapter three book three chapter four of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four tetzel approaches luther at the confessional tetzel's rage luther without a plan jealousy among the orders luther's discourse the elector's dream in so far as we know luther heard of tetzel for the first time at grimma in fifteen hundred and sixteen when he was on the eve of beginning his visit to the churches while staupitz was still with luther it was told him that an indulgence merchant was making a great noise at Würzen. even some of his extravagant sayings were quoted luther's indignation was roused and he exclaimed please god i'll make a hole in his drum tetzel on his return from berlin where he had met with a most friendly reception from the elector joachim brother of the farmer general took up his headquarters at jutterboch staupitz availing himself of his influence with the elector frederick had often represented to him the abuses of the indulgences and the scandalous proceedings of the mendicants and the princes of saxony feeling indignant at the shameful traffic had forbidden the merchant to enter their territory he was accordingly obliged to remain on those of the archbishop of magdeburg but at the same time came as near to saxony as he could jutterboch being only four miles from wittemberg 
this great thresher of purses says luther set about threshing the country in grand style so that the money began to leap tumble and tinkle in his chest the people of wittemberg went in crowds to the indulgence market of jutelbach at this period luther had the highest respect for the church and for the pope i was then said he a monk a most bigoted papist so intoxicated and imbued with the doctrines of rome that if i had been able i would willingly have lent a hand in killing any one audacious enough to refuse obedience to the pope in the minutest matter i was a real saul as many still are but at the same time his heart was ready to declare in favour of all that he believed to be the truth and against all that he believed to be error i was a young doctor just of the irons ardent and rejoicing in the word of the lord one day when luther had taken his seat in the confessional at wittemberg several citizens of the town came before him and one after another confessed the grossest immoralities adultery libertinism usury ill-gotten wealth were the crimes with which the minister of the word was entertained by persons of whose souls he was one day to give account he rebukes corrects and instructs them but what is his astonishment when these people tell him that they don't choose to abandon their sins quite amazed the pious monk declares that since they refuse to promise amendment he cannot give them absolution the wretched creatures then appealed to their letters of indulgence exhibiting them and extolling their virtues but luther replied that he cared little for the paper which they had shown him and added unless you repent you will all perish they made an outcry and expostulated but the doctor was immovable they must cease to do evil and learn to do well otherwise no absolution beware added he of lending an ear to the harangues of the vendors of indulgences you might be better employed than in buying those licenses which are sold you for the most paltry sum much alarmed these inhabitants of wittemberg hastened back to tetzel to tell him how his letters were disregarded by an augustine monk tetzel on hearing this became red with fury crying and stamping and cursing in the pulpit to strike a deeper terror into the people he repeatedly kindled a fire in the market-place declaring that he had received orders from the pope to burn all heretics who should dare to oppose his holy indulgences such is the circumstance which was not the cause but the first occasion of the reformation a pastor seeing the sheep of his flock in a path which must lead them to destruction makes an effort to deliver them as yet he has no thought of reforming the church and the world he has seen rome and its corruptions but he declares not against rome he perceives some of the abuses under which christianity is groaning but has no thought of correcting these abuses he has no desire to become reformer he has no plan for the reformation of the church any more than he had had one for himself god intends reform and for reform selects luther the same remedy which had proved so powerful in curing his own wretchedness the hand of god will employ by him to cure the miseries of christendom he remains quiet in the sphere which is assigned to him walking merely where his master calls him and fulfilling his duties as professor preacher and pastor at wittemberg while seated in the church his hearers come and open their hearts to him evil makes an assault upon him and error seeks him out of her own accord he is interfered with in the discharge of his duty and his conscience which is bound to the word of god resists is it not god that calls him to resist is a duty and being a duty is also a right he has no alternative but to speak in this way were events ordered by that god who was pleased says mathesius to restore christendom by means of the son of a forge master and to purify the impure doctrine of the church by making it to pass through his furnaces having given this detail 
it must be unnecessary to refute a false imputation invented by some of luther's enemies but not till after his death jealousy for his order it has been said grief at seeing a shameful and condemned traffic entrusted to the dominicans in preference to the augustins who had hitherto enjoyed it led the doctor of wittemberg to attack tetzel and his doctrines the well-known fact that this traffic was first offered to the augustines who refused it is sufficient to refute this fable which has been repeated by writers who have copied each other even cardinal pallavicini states that the augustines never had discharged this office besides we have seen the travail of luther's soul his conduct needs no other explanation it was impossible for him not to make open profession of the doctrine to which he owed his happiness in christianity every man who finds a blessing longs to make others partakers in it in our day it is time to abandon those puerile explanations which are unworthy of the great revolution of the sixteenth century to lift a world a more powerful lever was required the reformation existed not in luther only it was the offspring of his age luther impelled equally by obedience to the truth of god and by charity towards men mounted the pulpit he forewarned his hearers but as he himself says he did it gently his prince had obtained particular indulgences from the pope for the church of the castle of wittemberg and it was possible that some of the blows which he was going to level at the indulgences in question might fall on those of the elector no matter he will run the risk if he sought to please men he would not be the servant of christ no man can prove by scripture says the faithful minister of the word to the people of wittemberg that the justice of god exacts a penalty or satisfaction from the sinner the only duty which it imposes upon him is true repentance sincere conversion a resolution to bear the cross of jesus christ and to be diligent in good works it is a great error to think we can ourselves satisfy the justice of god for our sins he always pardons them gratuitously by his inestimable grace the christian church it is true requires something from the sinner and consequently has the power of remitting what she so requires but that is all even these indulgences of the church are tolerated only on account of indolent and imperfect christians who will not zealously exercise themselves in good works for they stimulate none to sanctification but leave all in imperfection then adverting to the pretext under which the indulgences were published he continues it would be much better to contribute to the erection of st peter's church from love to god than to purchase indulgences in this view but you ask are we then never to purchase them i have already said and i repeat it my advice is don't purchase leave them to sleepy christians but do you walk apart in your own path the faithful must be diverted from indulgences and urged to do the works which they neglect at last glancing at his adversaries luther concludes thus if some cry out that i am a heretic for the truth which i preach is very hurtful to their strong box their clamour gives me little concern they are dull and sickly brains men who never felt the bible never read christian doctrine never comprehended their own teachers and who turn to rottenness wrapped up in the tatters of their vain opinions god grant them and us a sound mind amen after these words the doctor descended from the pulpit leaving his hearers in astonishment at his bold language the sermon was printed and made a deep impression on all who read it tetzel answered it and luther replied but these discussions did not take place till a later period fifteen eighteen the feast of all saints drew near the chronicles of that day here relate a circumstance which though not important to the history of the period may however serve to characterize it 
it is a dream of the elector which in substance is unquestionably authentic though several circumstances may have been added by those who have related it it is mentioned by seckendorf who observes that the fear of giving their adversaries ground to say that the doctrine of luther was founded upon dreams has perhaps prevented several historians from speaking of it the elector frederick of saxony say the chronicles of the time was at his castle of schweinitz six leagues from wittemberg on the morning of thirty first of october being in company with his brother duke john who was then co-regent and became sole elector after his death and with his chancellor the elector said to the duke brother i must tell you a dream which i had last night and the meaning of which i should like much to know it is so deeply impressed on my mind that i will never forget it were i to live a thousand years for i dreamed it thrice at each time with new circumstances duke john is it a good or a bad dream the elector i know not god knows duke john don't be uneasy at it but be so good as to tell it to me the elector having gone to bed last night fatigued and out of spirits i fell asleep shortly after my prayer and slept quietly for about two hours and a half i then awoke and continued awake till midnight all sorts of thoughts passing through my mind among other things i thought how i was to observe the feast of all saints i prayed for the poor souls in purgatory and supplicated god to guide me my counsels and my people according to truth i again fell asleep and then dreamed that almighty god sent me a monk who was a true son of the apostle paul all the saints accompanied him by order of god in order to bear testimony before me and to declare that he did not come to contrive any plot but that all he did was according to the will of god they asked me to have the goodness graciously to permit him to write something on the door of the church of the castle of wittemberg this i granted through my chancellor thereupon the monk went to the church and began to write in such large characters that i could read the writing at schweinitz the pen which he used was so large that its end reached as far as rome where it pierced the ears of a lion that was couching there and caused the triple crown upon the head of the pope to shake all the cardinals and princes running hastily up tried to prevent it from falling you and i brother wished also to assist and i stretched out my arm but at this moment i awoke with my arm in the air quite amazed and very much enraged at the monk for not managing his pen better i recollected myself a little it was only a dream i was still half asleep and once more closed my eyes the dream returned the lion still annoyed by the pen began to roar with all his might so much so that the whole city of rome and all the states of the holy empire ran to see what the matter was the pope requested them to oppose this monk and applied particularly to me on account of his being in my country i again awoke repeated the lord's prayer entreated god to preserve his holiness and once more fell asleep then i dreamed that all the princes of the empire and we among them hastened to rome and strove one after another to break the pen but the more we tried the stiffer it became sounding as if it had been made of iron we at length desisted i then asked the monk for i was sometimes at rome and sometimes at wittemberg where he got this pen and why it was so strong the pen replied he belonged to an old goose of bohemia a hundred years old i got it from one of my old schoolmasters as to its strength it is owing to the impossibility of depriving it of its pith or marrow and i am quite astonished at it myself suddenly i heard a loud noise a large number of other pens had sprung out of the long pen of the monk i awoke a third time and it was daylight duke john chancellor what is your opinion would we had a joseph or a daniel enlightened by god chancellor 
Your highnesses know the common proverb that the dreams of young girls, learned men, and great lords have usually some hidden meaning. The meaning of this dream, however, we will not be able to know for some time, not till the things to which it relates have taken place. Wherefore, leave the accomplishment to God, and place it wholly in his hand. Duke John, I am of your opinion, Chancellor, tis not fit for us to annoy ourselves in attempting to discover the meaning. The God will overrule all for his glory. Elector, may our faithful God do so. Yet I will never forget this dream. I have indeed thought of an interpretation, but I keep it to myself. Time, perhaps, will show if I have been a good diviner. Thus, according to the manuscript of Weimar, the morning of 31st of October was spent at Schweinitz. Let us see how the evening was spent at Wittenberg. We again return to the province of history. End of Book 3, Chapter 4book three chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five feast of all saints the theses their force moderation providence letter to albert indifference of the bishops dissemination of the theses the words of luther had produced little effect tetzel without troubling himself continued his traffic and his impious harangues will luther submit to these crying abuses and keep silence as a pastor he has earnestly exhorted those who have had recourse to his ministry and as a preacher he has lifted his warning voice in the pulpit it still remains for him to speak as a theologian to address not individuals in the confessional not the assembly of the faithful in the church of wittemberg but all who like himself are teachers of the word of god his resolution is taken he has no thought of attacking the church or of putting the pope on his defence on the contrary it is his respect for the pope that will not allow him to be any longer silent with regard to claims by which he is injured he must take the part of the pope against audacious men who dare to associate his venerable name with their disgraceful traffic far from thinking of a revolution which is to destroy the primacy of rome luther expects to have the pope and catholicism for his allies against impudent monks the feast of all saints was an important day for wittemberg and especially for the church which the elector had there erected and filled with relics on that day these relics adorned with silver and gold and precious stones were brought out and exhibited to the eyes of the people who were astonished and dazzled by their magnificence whoever on that day visited the church and confessed in it obtained a valuable indulgence accordingly on this great occasion pilgrims came in crowds to wittemberg on the thirty first of october fifteen hundred and seventeen luther who had already taken his resolution walks boldly towards the church to which the superstitious crowds of pilgrims were repairing and puts up on the door of this church ninety-five theses or propositions against the doctrine of indulgences neither the elector nor staupitz nor spalatin nor any even the most intimate of his friends had been previously informed of this step in these theses luther declares in a kind of preamble that he had written them with the express desire of setting the truth in the full light of day he declares himself ready to defend them on the morrow at the university against all and sundry the attention which they excite is great they are read and repeated in a short time the pilgrims the university the whole town is ringing with them the following are some of these propositions written with the pen of the monk and fixed on the door of the church of wittemberg number one 
when our lord and master jesus christ says repent he means that the whole life of his followers on the earth is a constant and continual repentance number two this expression cannot be understood of the sacrament of penitence that is to say of confession and satisfaction as administered by the priest number three still the lord intends not to speak merely of internal repentance internal repentance is null if it does not manifest itself externally by the mortification of the flesh number four repentance and sorrow that is to say true penitence continue so long as a man is displeased with himself that is until he passes from this life into life eternal number five the pope is not able and does not wish to remit any other penalty than that which he has imposed of his own good pleasure or conformably to the canons that is to say the papal ordinances number six the pope cannot remit any condemnation but only declare and confirm the remission which god himself has given at least he can only do it in cases which belong to him if he does otherwise the condemnation remains exactly as before number eight the laws of ecclesiastical penance ought to be imposed on the living only and have nothing to do with the dead number twenty one the commissaries of indulgence are mistaken when they say that the pope's indulgence delivers from all punishment and saves number twenty five the same power which the pope has over purgatory throughout the church each bishop has individually in his own diocese and each curate in his own parish number twenty seven it is the preaching of human folly to pretend that at the very moment when the money tinkles in the strong box the soul flies off from purgatory number twenty eight this much is certain as soon as the money tinkles avarice and the love of gain arrive increase and multiply but the aids and prayers of the church depend only on the will and good pleasure of god number thirty two those who imagine they are sure of salvation by means of indulgences will go to the devil with those who teach them so number thirty five it is an anti-christian doctrine to pretend that in order to deliver a soul from purgatory or to purchase an indulgence there is no need of either sorrow or repentance number thirty six every christian who truly repents of his sins has entire forgiveness of the penalty and the fault and so far has no need of indulgence number thirty seven every true christian dead or alive participates in all the blessings of christ and of the church by the gift of god and without a letter of indulgence number thirty eight still the dispensation and pardon of the pope must not be despised for his pardon is a declaration of the pardon of god number forty genuine sorrow and repentance seek love and punishment but the mildness of indulgence takes off the fear of punishment and begets hatred against it number forty two christians must be told that the pope has no wish and no intention that they should in any respect compare the act of purchasing indulgences with any work of mercy number forty three christians must be told that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does better than he who buys an indulgence number forty four for the work of charity makes charity increase and renders a man more pious whereas the indulgence does not make him better but only gives him more self-confidence and makes him more secure against punishment number forty five christians must be told that he who sees his neighbour want and instead of helping him purchases an indulgence purchases not the indulgence of the pope but incurs the divine displeasure number forty six christians must be told that if they have no superfluity they are bound to keep what they have in order to procure necessaries for their families and not to lavish it on indulgences number forty seven 
Christians must be told that to purchase an indulgence is optional, not obligatory. Number 48. Christians must be told that the Pope, having more need of prayer offered up in faith than of money, desires the prayer more than the money when he dispenses indulgences. Number 49. Christians must be told that the indulgence of the Pope is good, provided they do not place their confidence in it, but that nothing is more hurtful if it diminishes piety. Number 50. Christians must be told that if the Pope knew of the extortions of the preachers of indulgences, he would rather that the metropolis of St. Peter were burned and reduced to ashes than see it built with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep number fifty one christians must be told that the pope as is his duty would dispense his own money to the poor people whom the preachers of indulgences are now robbing of their last penny were he for that purpose even to sell the metropolis of st peter number fifty two to hope to be saved by indulgences is an empty and lying hope even should the commissary of indulgences nay the pope himself be pleased to pledge his own soul in security of it number fifty three those who on account of the preaching of indulgences forbid the preaching of the word of god are enemies of the pope and of jesus christ number fifty five the Pope cannot have any other thought than this. If the indulgence, which is the lesser matter, is celebrated with bell, pomp, and ceremony, it is necessary, a fortiori, to honour and celebrate the gospel, which is the greater matter, with a hundred bells, a hundred pomps, and a hundred ceremonies. Number 62. The true and precious treasure of the Church is the holy gospel of the glory and grace of God number sixty five the treasures of the gospel are nets which once caught the rich and those who were at ease in their circumstances number sixty six but the treasures of indulgence are nets in which nowadays they catch not rich people but the riches of people number sixty seven it is the duty of bishops and pastors to receive the commissaries of apostolic indulgences with all respect number sixty eight but it is still more their duty to use their eyes and their ears in order to see that the said commissaries do not preach the dreams of their own imaginations instead of the orders of the pope number seventy one cursed be he who speaketh against the indulgence of the pope number seventy two but blessed be he who speaks against the foolish and impudent words of the preachers of indulgences number seventy six the indulgence of the pope cannot take away the smallest daily sin in regard to the fault or delinquency number seventy nine to say that a cross adorned with the arms of the pope is as powerful as the cross of christ is blasphemy number eighty bishops pastors and theologians who allow such things to be said to the people will be called to account for it number eighty one this shameful preaching these impudent eulogiums on indulgences make it difficult for the learned to defend the dignity and honour of the pope against the calumnies of the preachers and the subtle and puzzling questions of the common people number eighty six why say they does not the pope whose wealth is greater than that of rich croesus build the metropolis of st peter with his own money rather than with that of poor christians number ninety two would then that we were discomfited of all the preachers who say to the church of christ peace peace when there is no peace number ninety four christians should be exhorted to diligence in following christ their head through crosses death and hell number ninety five for it is far better to enter the kingdom of heaven through much tribulation than to acquire a carnal security by the flattery of a false peace here then was the commencement of the work the germ of the reformation was contained in these theses of luther the abuses of indulgence were attacked in them and this was their most striking feature 
but behind those attacks there was moreover a principle which although it attracted the attention of the multitude far less was destined one day to overthrow the edifice of the papacy the evangelical doctrine of a free and gratuitous remission of sins was here publicly professed for the first time henceforth the work must grow in fact it was evident that any man who had faith in the remission of sins as preached by the doctor of wittemberg any one who had this conversion and sanctification the necessity of which he urged would no longer concern himself about human ordinances but would escape from the swaddling bands of rome and secure the liberty of the children of god all errors behoved to give way before this truth by it light had at first entered luther's own mind and by it in like manner light is to be diffused in the church what previous reformers wanted was a clear knowledge of this truth and hence the unfruitfulness of their labours luther himself was afterwards aware that in proclaiming justification by faith he had laid the axe to the root of the tree this is the doctrine said he which we attack in the followers of the papacy huss and wycliffe only attacked their lives but in attacking their doctrine we take the goose by the neck all depends on the word which the pope took from us and falsified i have vanquished the pope because my doctrine is according to god and his is according to the devil we too have in our day forgotten the capital doctrine of justification by faith though in a sense the reverse of that of our fathers in the time of luther says one of our contemporaries the remission of sins at least cost money but in our day every one supplies himself gratis these two extremes are very much alike perhaps there is even more forgetfulness of god in our extreme than in that of the sixteenth century the principle of justification by the grace of god which brought the church out of so much darkness at the time of the reformation is also the only principle which can renew our generation put an end to its doubts and waverings destroy the canker of egotism establish the reign of morality and justice and in one word reunite the world to god from whom it has been separated but if the theses of luther were mighty in virtue of the truth which they proclaimed they were not less so through the faith of their declared defender he had boldly unsheathed the sword of the word and he had done it trusting to the power of truth he had felt that in leaning on the promises of god he could in the language of the world afford to risk something speaking of this bold attack he says let him who would begin a good enterprise undertake it trusting to its own merits and not of this let him beware to the help and countenance of man moreover let not men nor even the whole world deter him for these words will never deceive it is good to trust in the lord and none that trust in him shall be confounded but let him who neither is able nor willing to hazard something through trust in god beware of undertaking anything doubtless luther after putting up his theses on the door of the church of all saints retired to his tranquil cell in full possession of the peace and joy imparted by an action done in the name of the lord and for the sake of eternal truth these theses notwithstanding of their great boldness still bespeak the monk who refuses to allow a single doubt as to the authority of the see of rome but in attacking the doctrine of indulgences luther had without perceiving it assailed several errors the exposure of which could not be agreeable to the pope seeing that they tended sooner or later to bring his supremacy in question luther at the time did not see so far but he felt all the boldness of the step which he had just taken and consequently thought himself bound to temper it in so far as was consistent with the respect due to truth he accordingly presented his theses only as doubtful propositions on which he was anxious for the views of the learned 
and conformably to the established custom annexed to them a solemn protestation declaring that he wished not to say or affirm anything not founded on holy scripture the fathers of the church and the rites and decretals of the see of rome often in the sequel on contemplating the immense and unlooked-for consequences of this courageous attack luther was astonished at himself and could not understand how he had ventured upon it an invisible hand mightier than his own held the leading reins and pushed him into a path which he knew not and from the difficulties of which he would perhaps have recoiled if he had known them and had been advancing alone and of himself i engaged in this dispute says he without premeditated purpose without knowing it or wishing it and was taken quite unprepared for the truth of this i appeal to the searcher of hearts luther had become acquainted with the source of these abuses he had received a little book ornamented with the arms of the archbishop of mentz and magdeburg and containing the regulations to be observed in the sale of indulgences it was this young prelate therefore this accomplished prince who had prescribed or at least sanctioned all this quackery in him luther only sees a superior to whom he owes fear and reverence and wishing not to beat the air but to address those entrusted with the government of the church he sends him a letter distinguished at once by its frankness and humility luther wrote this letter to albert the same day on which he put up his theses pardon me most reverend father in christ and most illustrious prince says he to him if i who am only the dregs of mankind have the presumption to write to your high mightiness the lord jesus is my witness that feeling how small and despicable i am i have long put off doing it will your highness however be pleased to let fall a look on a grain of dust and in accordance with your episcopal meekness graciously receive my petition there are people who are carrying the papal indulgence up and down the country in the name of your grace i do not so much blame the declamation of the preachers i have not heard them as the erroneous ideas of unlearned and simple people who imagine that by buying indulgences they secure their salvation good god souls entrusted to your care most venerable father are conducted to death and not to life the just and strict account which will be required of you grows and augments from day to day i have not been able to continue longer silent ah man is not saved by works or by the performances of his bishop even the righteous scarcely is saved and the way that leadeth unto life is straight why then do the preachers of indulgences by vain fables inspire the people with a false security according to them indulgence alone ought to be proclaimed ought to be extolled what is it not the chief and only duty of the bishops to instruct the people in the gospel and the love of jesus christ jesus christ has nowhere ordered the preaching of indulgence but has strongly enjoined the preaching of the gospel how dreadful then and how perilous for a bishop to allow the gospel to be passed in silence and nothing but the sound of indulgence to be incessantly dunned into the ears of his people most worthy father in god in the instruction of the commissaries which has been published in the name of your grace doubtless without your knowledge it is said that the indulgence is the most precious treasure that it reconciles man to god and enables those who purchase it to dispense with repentance what then can i what ought i to do most venerable bishop most serene prince ah i supplicate your highness by the lord jesus christ to turn upon this business an eye of paternal vigilance to suppress the pamphlet entirely and ordain preachers to deliver a different sort of discourses to the people if you decline to do so be assured you will one day hear some voice raised in refutation of these preachers to the great dishonour of your most serene highness luther at the same time sent his theses to the archbishop and in a postscript asked him to read them that he might be convinced how little foundation there was for the doctrine of indulgences 
thus luther's whole desire was that the watchmen of the church should awake and exert themselves in putting an end to the evils which were laying it waste nothing could be more noble and more respectful than this letter from a monk to one of the greatest princes of the church and the empire never was there a better exemplification of the spirit of our saviour's precept render unto caesar the things which are caesar's and unto god the things which are god's this is not the course of violent revolutionists who contemn powers and blame dignities it is a cry proceeding from the conscience of a christian and a priest who gives honour to all but in the first place fears god however all prayers and supplications were useless young albert engrossed by his pleasures and ambitious designs made no reply to this solemn appeal the bishop of brandenburg luther's ordinary a learned and pious man to whom also he sent his theses replied that he was attacking the power of the church that he would involve himself in great trouble and vexation that the thing was beyond his strength and that his earnest advice to him was to keep quiet the princes of the church shut their ears against the voice of god thus energetically and affectingly declared by the instrumentality of luther they would not comprehend the signs of the times they were struck with that blindness which has been the ruin of so many powers and dignities both thought says luther afterwards that the pope would be too many for a miserable mendicant like me but luther was better able than the bishops to perceive the disastrous effects which the indulgences had upon the manners and lives of the people for he was in direct correspondence with them he had constantly a near view of what the bishops learned only by unfaithful reports if the bishops failed him god did not fail him the head of the church who sits in heaven and to whom has been given all power on the earth had himself prepared the ground and deposited the grain in the hands of his servant he gave wings to the seed of truth and sent it in an instant over the whole length and breadth of his church nobody appeared at the university next day to attack the propositions of luther the traffic of tetzel was too much in discredit and too disgraceful for any other than himself or some one of his creatures to dare to take up the gauntlet but these theses were destined to be heard in other places than under the roof of an academic hall scarcely had they been nailed to the door of the castle church of wittemberg than the feeble strokes of the hammer were followed throughout germany by a blow which reached even to the foundations of proud rome threatening sudden ruin to the walls the gates and the pillars of the papacy stunning and terrifying its champions and at the same time awakening thousands from the sleep of error these theses spread with the rapidity of lightning a month had not elapsed before they were at rome in a fortnight says a contemporary historian they were in every part of germany and in four weeks had traversed almost the whole of christendom as if the angels themselves had been the messengers and carried them before the eyes of all men nobody can believe what a noise they made they were afterwards translated into dutch and spanish and a traveller even sold them at jerusalem everyone says luther was complaining of the indulgences and as all the bishops and doctors had kept silence and nobody had ventured to bell the cat poor luther became a famous doctor because as they expressed it one had at length come who dared to do it but i liked not this glory the music seemed to me too lofty for the words some of the pilgrims who had flocked from different countries to wittemberg for the feast of all saints instead of indulgences carried home with them the famous theses of the augustine monk and thus helped to circulate them all read pondered and commented on them they occupied the attention of all convents and all universities all pious monks who had entered the cloister to save their souls all upright and honest men rejoiced in this striking and simple confession of the truth and wished with all their heart that luther would continue the work which he had begun 
at length a monk had had the courage to undertake this perilous contest it was a reparation made to christendom and the public conscience was satisfied in these theses piety saw a blow given to all kinds of superstition the new theology hailed in them the defeat of the scholastic dogmas princes and magistrates regarded them as a barrier raised against the encroachments of ecclesiastical power while the nations were delighted at seeing the decided negative which this monk had given to the avarice of the roman chancery erasmus a man very worthy of credit and one of the principal rivals of the reformer says to duke george of saxony when luther attacked this fable the whole world concurred in applauding him i observe said he on another occasion to cardinal campeggi that those of the purest morals and an evangelical piety are the least opposed to luther his life is lauded even by those who cannot bear his faith the world was weary of a doctrine containing so many childish fables and was thirsting for that living water pure and hidden which issues from the springs of the evangelists and the apostles the genius of luther was fitted to accomplish these things and his zeal must have animated him to the noble enterprise end of book three chapter five book three chapter six of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six reuchlin erasmus fleck bibra the emperor the pope myconius the monks apprehensions adelman an old priest the bishop the elector the inhabitants of erfurt luther's reply trouble luther's moving principle we must follow these propositions wherever they penetrated to the studies of the learned the cells of monks and the palaces of princes in order to form some idea of the various but wonderful effects which they produced in germany reuchlin received them he was weary of the hard battle which he had been obliged to fight against the monks the power which the new combatant displayed in his theses revived the spirit of the old champion of letters and gave joy to his saddened heart thanks be to god exclaimed he after he had read them now they have found a man who will give them so much to do that they will be obliged to let me end my old age in peace the prudent erasmus was in the netherlands when the theses reached him he was inwardly delighted at seeing his secret wishes for the reformation of abuses expressed with so much boldness and commended their author only exhorting him to more moderation and prudence nevertheless some persons in his presence blaming luther's violence said god has given men a cure which cuts thus deep into the flesh because otherwise the disease would be incurable and at a later period when the elector of saxony asked his opinion as to luther's affair he replied with a smile i am not at all astonished at his having made so much noise for he has committed two unpardonable faults he has attacked the tiara of the pope and the belly of the monks dr fleck prior of the cloister of steinlausitz had for some time given up reading mass but had not told any one his reason he one day found the theses of luther posted up in the refectory of his convent he went up and began to read them but had only perused a few when unable to contain his joy he exclaimed well well he whom we have been so long looking for is come at last and this you monks will see then reading in the future says mathesius and playing upon the word wittemberg he said everybody will come to seek wisdom at this mountain and will find it alle welt von diesem weissenberg weisheit holen und bekommen he wrote to the doctor to persevere courageously in his glorious combat luther calls him a man full of joy and consolation 
the ancient and celebrated episcopal see of Würzburg was then held by Lorenz de Bibre, a man, according to the testimony of his contemporaries, pious, honest, and wise. When a gentleman came to intimate to him that he intended his daughter for the cloister, "'Give her rather a husband,' said he, and then added, "'Are you in want of money for that purpose? I will lend you.' the emperor and all the princes held him in the highest esteem he lamented the disorders of the church and especially those of convents the theses having reached his palace also he read them with great delight and publicly declared his approbation of luther at a later period he wrote to the elector frederick don't part with pious dr martin luther for he has been wronged the elector, delighted at this testimony, wrote to the reformer with his own hand to acquaint him with it. The Emperor Maximilian, predecessor of Charles V, also read and admired the theses of the monk of Wittenberg. He perceived his talents, and foresaw that this obscure Augustine might indeed become a powerful ally of Germany in her struggle with Rome. Accordingly, he instructed his envoy to say to the elector of Saxony, Take good care of the monk Luther, for the time may come when we shall have need of him. And shortly after, being at a diet with Pfeffinger, the elector's confidential counsellor, he said to him, Well, what is your Augustine doing? Assuredly, his propositions are not to be despised. He will give the monks enough to do. At Rome, even, and in the Vatican, the theses were not so ill-received as might have been supposed. Leo X judged of them as a friend of letters rather than a pope. The amusement which they gave him made him overlook the severe truths which they contained. And when Sylvester Prieras, the master of the sacred palace, who had the office of examining new works, urged him to treat Luther as a heretic, he replied, this friar, Martin Luther, is a great genius. All that is said against him is mere monkish jealousy. There were few on whom the theses of Luther produced a deeper impression than on the scholar of Annaberg, whom Tetzel had so pitilessly repulsed. Myconius had entered a convent, and the very first evening dreamed he saw an immense field quite covered with ripe corn. Cut, said the voice of his guide to him, and when he excused himself for want of skill, his guide showed him a reaper who was working with inconceivable rapidity. "'Follow and do like him,' said the guide. Myconius, eager for holiness as Luther had been, devoted himself when in the convent to vigils, fasts, macerations, and all the works invented by men, but at length he despaired of ever attaining the objects of his efforts. He abandoned study and spent his whole time in manual labor. Sometimes he bound books, sometimes used the turning lathe, and sometimes did any other kind of work. Still, however, this external labor did not appease his troubled conscience. God had spoken to him, and he could not fall back into his former slumber. This state of agony lasted for several years. It is sometimes supposed that the paths of the reformers were quite smooth, and that after they renounced the observances of the church, their remaining course was easy and pleasant. It is not considered that they arrived at the truth by means of internal struggles a thousand times more painful than the observances to which servile minds easily submitted. At length the year 1517 arrived. The theses of Luther were published, and, traversing Christendom, arrived also at the convent where the scholar of Annaberg was residing. He hid himself in a corner of the cloister with John Voigt, another monk, that they might be able to read them without interruption. They contained the very truth of which his father had told him. His eyes were opened. He felt a voice within him responding to that which was then sounding throughout Germany, and great consolation filled his heart. I see plainly, said he, that Martin Luther is the reaper whom I saw in my dream, and who taught me to gather the ears of corn. He immediately began to profess the doctrine which Luther had proclaimed. 
the monks alarmed when they heard him argued with him and declaimed against luther and against his convent that convent replied myconius is like our lord's sepulchre they wish to prevent christ from rising again but will not succeed at last his superiors seeing they could not convince him interdicted him for a year and a half from all intercourse with the world not permitting him even to write or to receive letters and threatening him with perpetual imprisonment however for him also the hour of deliverance arrived being afterwards appointed pastor at zwickau he was the first who declared against the papacy in the churches of thuringia then says he i could work with my venerable father luther at the gospel harvest jonas describes him as a man as able as he was willing doubtless there were others also to whom luther's theses were the signal of life they kindled a new light in many cells cottages and palaces while those who had entered convents in quest of good fare and indolence or rank and honours says Mathesius, began to load the name of luther with reproaches the monks who lived in prayer fasting and mortification thanked god as soon as they heard the cry of the eagle announced by john huss a century before even the people who did not well understand the theology of the question and who only knew that luther was assailing the empire of mendicants and lazy monks received it with bursts of joy an immense sensation was produced in germany by his bold propositions however some of the reformers contemporaries who foresaw the consequences to which they might lead and the numerous obstacles which they were destined to encounter loudly expressed their fears or at most rejoiced with trembling i am much afraid wrote the excellent canon of augsburg bernard adelman to his friend pirkeimer that the worthy man must yield at last to the avarice and power of the partisans of indulgences his representations have had so little effect that the bishop of augsburg our primate and metropolitan has just ordered new indulgences in the name of the pope for st peter's at rome let him hasten to seek the aid of princes let him beware of tempting god for it were to show an absolute want of sense to overlook the imminent danger to which he is exposed Adelman was greatly delighted when it was rumoured that Henry the Eighth had invited Luther to England. There, thought he, he will be able to teach the truth in peace. Several thus imagined that the doctrine of the gospel was to be supported by the power of princes, not knowing that it advances without this power, and is often trammelled and weakened by the possession of it. The celebrated historian Albert Krantz was at Hamburg on his deathbed when Luther's theses were brought to him. "'You are right, Friar Martin,' he exclaimed, "'but you will not succeed. Poor monk, go into your cell and cry, Lord, have mercy on me.'" An old priest of Hexter in Westphalia, having received and read the theses in his presbytery, said in low German, shaking his head, dear friar martin if you succeed in overthrowing this purgatory and all these paper merchants assuredly you are a mighty seigneur erbenius a century later wrote beneath these words the following stanza quid vero nunc si viveret bonus iste clericus diseret what then would the good clerk say were he alive to see this day not only did many of luther's friends entertain fears as to the step which he had taken but several even testified their disapprobation the bishop of brandenburg distressed at seeing his diocese the scene of so important a contest was anxious to suppress it he resolved to take the gentle method and employed the abbot of lenin to say to luther in his name i don't find anything in the theses contrary of catholic truth i myself condemn these indiscreet proclamations but for the love of peace and deference to your bishop cease writing on the subject luther was confounded at being thus humbly addressed by so great an abbot and so great a bishop and led away by the feelings of the moment replied i consent i would rather obey than work miracles were it in my power 
the elector was grieved at the commencement of a contest which was no doubt legitimate but the end of which it was impossible to foresee no prince was more desirous than frederick for the maintenance of public peace now what an immense fire might this small spark not kindle what discord what rending of nations might this quarrel of monks not produce the elector repeatedly made luther aware how much he was annoyed even in his own order and his own convent at wittemberg luther met with disapprobation the prior and sub-prior terrified at the clamour of tetzel and his companions repaired in fear and trembling to the cell of friar martin and said do not we entreat you bring shame on our order the other orders and especially the dominicans are overjoyed to think that they are not to be alone in disgrace luther was moved by these words but soon recovering himself he replied dear fathers if the thing is not done in the name of god it will fail but if it is let it proceed the prior and sub prior said no more the thing proceeds even now adds luther after relating this anecdote and please god always will proceed better and better even to the end amen luther had many other attacks to sustain at erfurt he was accused of violence and pride in his manner of condemning the opinions of others the charge usually brought against those who act under the strong conviction which the word of god gives he was also charged with precipitation and fickleness they call upon me for moderation replied luther and they themselves in the judgment which they pass on me trample it under foot we see the mote in our brother's eye and observe not the beam in our own truth will no more gain by my moderation than it will lose by my presumption i desire to know continued he addressing Lange, what errors you and your theologians have found in my theses who knows not that a new idea is seldom advanced without an appearance of arrogance and an accusation of disputatiousness were humility herself to undertake something new those of an opposite opinion would charge her with pride why were christ and all the martyrs put to death because they were deemed proud despisers of the wisdom of the time and advanced new truths without previously taking counsel of the organs of ancient opinion let not the wise of the present day then expect of me humility or rather hypocrisy enough to ask their opinion before publishing what duty calls me to say what i do will be done not by the prudence of men but by the counsel of god if the work is of god who can arrest it if it is not of god who can advance it not my will not theirs nor ours but thy will be done o holy father who art in heaven in these words what courage what noble enthusiasm what confidence in god and above all what truth truth fitted to all times still the reproaches and accusations which assailed luther from all quarters failed not to make some impression on his mind his hopes were disappointed he had expected to see the heads of the church and the most distinguished scholars of the nation publicly uniting with him but it was otherwise a word of approbation allowed to escape at the first moment of enthusiasm was all that the best disposed gave him while several of those whom he had till then most highly venerated were loud in censuring him he felt himself alone in the whole church alone against rome alone at the foot of that ancient and formidable edifice whose foundations lay deep in the bowels of the earth whose battlements reached the clouds and at which he had just struck a daring blow he was troubled and depressed doubts which he thought he had surmounted returned with new force he trembled at the thought of having the authority of the whole church against him of withdrawing from that authority and resisting that voice which nations and ages had humbly obeyed of setting himself in opposition to that church which he had from infancy been accustomed to venerate as the mother of the faithful he a paltry monk the effort was too great for man no step cost him more than this and accordingly 
it was the step which decided the reformation the struggle which took place in his soul cannot be better described than in his own words i began this affair says he with great fear and trembling who was i a poor miserable despicable friar liker a corpse than a living man who was i to oppose the majesty of the pope before whom not only the kings of the earth and the whole world but also if i may so speak heaven and hell trembled compelled to yield obedience to his nod nobody can imagine what my heart suffered during those first two years and into what depression i might say what despair i was often plunged no idea of it can be formed by those proud spirits who afterwards attacked the pope with great boldness although with all their ability they could not have done him the least harm had not jesus christ by me his feeble and unworthy instrument given him a wound which never will be cured but while they were contented to look on and leave me alone in danger i was not so joyful so tranquil or so sure about the business for at that time i did not know many things which thank god i know now it is true several pious christians were much pleased with my propositions and set a great value upon them but i could not own and regard them as organs of the holy spirit i looked only to the pope the cardinals bishops theologians juris consults monks and priests that was the direction from which i expected the spirit to come still having by means of scripture come off victorious over all contrary arguments i have at length by the grace of christ though after much pain travail and anguish surmounted the only argument which arrested me viz that it is necessary to listen to the church for from the bottom of my heart i honoured the church of the pope as the true church and did so with much more sincerity and veneration than those shameless and infamous corruptors who are now so very forward in opposing me had i despised the pope as much as he is despised in the hearts of those who praise him so loudly with their lips i would have dreaded that the earth would instantly open and swallow me up as it did cora and his company how honourable these misgivings are to luther how well they display the sincerity and uprightness of his soul and how much more worthy of respect do those painful assaults which he had to sustain both within and without prove him to be than mere intrepidity without any such struggle could have done the travail of his soul clearly displays the truth and divinity of his work we see that their origin and principle were in heaven after all the facts which we have stated who will presume to say that the reformation was an affair of politics no assuredly it was not the effect of human policy but of the power of god had luther been urged by human passions only he would have yielded to his fears his miscalculations and scruples would have smothered the fire which had been kindled in his soul and he would only have thrown a transient gleam upon the church in the same way as the many zealous and pious men whose names have come down to us but now god's time had arrived the work was not to be arrested the emancipation of the church was to be accomplished luther was destined at least to prepare that complete emancipation and those extensive developments which are promised to the kingdom of christ accordingly he experienced the truth of the magnificent promise the strong men shall faint and be weary and the young men utterly fail but they who wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles this divine power which filled the heart of the doctor of wittemberg and which had engaged him in the combat soon gave him back all his former resolution End of Book 3, Chapter 6。Book 3, Chapter 7 of History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 1, by Jean Henri Merle d'Aubigne. Translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Tetzel's Attack, Luther's Reply, Good Works, luther and spalatin study of scripture 
Schürl and Luther, Doubts on the Theses, Luther for the People, A New Suit. The reproaches, timidity, or silence of Luther's friends had discouraged him. The attacks of his enemies had the very opposite effect. This frequently happens. The adversaries of the truth, while thinking by their violence to do their own work, often do that of God himself. The gauntlet which had been thrown down was taken up by Tetzel with a feeble hand. Luther's sermon, which had been to the people what his theses had been to the learned, was the subject of his first reply. He refuted it point by point in his own way, and then announced that he was preparing to combat his adversary at greater length in theses which he would maintain at the University of Frankfurt on the Oder. Then, said he, adverting to the conclusion of Luther's sermon, then every one will be able to judge who is heresiarch, heretic, schismatic, erroneous, rash, and calumnious. Then it will be manifest to the eyes of all who has a dull brain, who has never felt the Bible, read Christian doctrines, understood his own teachers. In maintaining the propositions which I advance, I am ready to suffer all things, prison, cudgel, water, and fire. One thing which strikes us in reading this production of Tetzel is the difference between his German and that of Luther. One would say that an interval of several ages is between them. A foreigner, especially, sometimes finds it difficult to comprehend Tetzel, whereas the language of Luther is almost the same as that of our day. A comparison of the two is sufficient to show that Luther is the creator of the German language. No doubt this is one of his least merits, but still it is one. Luther replied without naming Tetzel. Tetzel had not named him. But there was nobody in Germany who could not have placed at the head of their publications the name which they had judged it expedient to suppress. Tetzel tried to confound the repentance which God demands with the penance which the Church imposes, in order to give a higher value to his indulgences. Luther made it his business to clear up this point. To avoid many words, said he in his graphic style, I give to the wind, which, besides, has more leisure than I have, his other words, which are only sheets of paper and withered leaves, and I content myself with examining the foundations of his house of burr thistle. The penitence which the Holy Father imposes cannot be that which Jesus Christ demands, for whatever the Holy Father imposes he can dispense with, and if these two penitences were one and the same, it would follow that the Holy Father takes away what Jesus appoints, and thereby makes void the commandment of God. Ah, if it so pleases him, let him maltreat me, continues Luther, after quoting other false interpretations of Tetzel. Let him call me heretic, schismatic, calumniator, or anything he likes. I will not on that account be his enemy, but will pray for him as for a friend. But it is not possible to allow him to treat the Holy Scriptures, our consolation, Romans 15.4, as a sow treats a sack of corn. We must accustom ourselves to Luther's occasional use of expressions too harsh and homely for our age. It was the custom of the time, and under those words which in our days would violate the proprieties of language, there is usually a force and justice which disposes us to pardon their rankness. He continues thus, He who buys indulgences, say our adversaries, does better than he who gives alms to a poor man, not absolutely in extremity. Now let them tell us that the Turks are profaning our churches and crosses, we will be able to hear it without a shudder, for we have amongst ourselves Turks a hundred times worse, who profane and annihilate the only true sanctuary, the word of God, which sanctifies all things. Let him who would follow this precept take good care not to give food to the hungry, nor clothing to the naked, before they give up the ghost, and consequently have no need of his assistance. It is important to contrast the zeal which Luther thus manifests for good works with what he says of justification by faith. 
indeed no man who has any experience or any knowledge of christianity needs this new proof of a truth of which he is fully assured viz that the more we adhere to justification by faith the more strongly we feel the necessity of works and the more diligently we practise them whereas lax views as to the doctrine of faith necessarily lead to laxity of conduct luther as st paul before and howard after him are proofs of the former all men without faith and with such the world is filled are proofs of the latter luther comes next to the insulting language of tetzel and pays him back in his own way at the sound of these invectives methinks i hear a large ass braying at me i am delighted at it and would be very sorry that such people should give me the name of a good christian we must give luther as he is with all his foibles this turn for pleasantry coarse pleasantry was one of them the reformer was a great man undoubtedly a man of god but he was a man not an angel and not even a perfect man who is entitled to call upon him for perfection for the rest adds he challenging his opponent to the combat although it is not usual to burn heretics for such points here at wittemberg am i dr martin luther is there any inquisitor who pretends to chew fire and make rocks leap into the air i give him to know that he has a safe conduct to come here an open door and bed and board certain all by the gracious care of our admirable duke frederick who will never protect heresy we see that luther was not deficient in courage he trusted to the word of god a rock which never gives way in the tempest but god in faithfulness gave him still further aid the bursts of joy with which the multitude had hailed luther's theses were soon succeeded by a gloomy silence the learned had timidly drawn back on hearing the calamities and insults of tetzel and the dominicans the bishops who had previously been loud in condemnation of the abuses of indulgences seeing them at length attacked had not failed with an inconsistency of which there are but too many examples to find that at that time the attack was inopportune the greater part of the reformers friends were frightened several of them had fled but when the first terror was over the minds of men took an opposite direction the monk of wittemberg soon saw himself again surrounded with a great number of friends and admirers there was one who although timid remained faithful to him throughout this crisis and whose friendship at once solaced and supported him this was spalatin their correspondence was not interrupted i thank you says he when speaking of a particular mark of friendship which he had received from him but what do i not owe you it was on the eleventh of november just fifteen days after the publication of the theses and consequently when the minds of men were in a state of the greatest fermentation that luther thus delights to unbosom his gratitude to his friend in the same letter to spalatin it is interesting to see the strong man who had just performed a most daring exploit declaring from what source he derives his strength we can do nothing of ourselves we can do everything by the grace of god by us all ignorance is invincible but no ignorance is invincible by the grace of god the more we endeavor of ourselves to attain to wisdom the nearer we approach to folly it is not true that this invincible ignorance excuses the sinner were it so there would be no sin in the world luther had not sent his propositions either to the prince or to any of his courtiers the chaplain seems to have expressed some surprise at this and luther answers i did not wish my theses to reach our illustrious prince or any of his court before those who think themselves specially addressed had received them lest it should be thought that i had published them by the order of the prince or to gain his favour or from opposition to the bishop of mentz i hear there are already several who dream such things but now i can swear in all safety that my theses were published without the knowledge of duke frederick 
if spalatin solaced his friend and supported him by his influence luther on his part was desirous to meet the requests of the modest chaplain the latter among other questions asked one which is frequently repeated in our day what is the best method of studying the holy scriptures till now my dear spalatin replied luther you have asked questions which i could answer but to direct you in the study of the scriptures is more than i am able to do however if you would absolutely know my method i will not hide it from you it is most certain that we cannot succeed in comprehending the scripture either by study or mere intellect your first duty then is to begin with prayer entreat the lord that he will in his great mercy deign to grant you the true knowledge of his word there is no other interpreter of the word of god than the author of that word according as it is said they will all be taught of god hope nothing from your works nothing from your intellect trust only in god and in the influence of his spirit believe one who is speaking from experience we see here how luther attained possession of the truth of which he was a preacher it was not as some pretend by confiding in a presumptuous reason nor as others maintain by abandoning himself to hateful passions the source from which he drew it was the purest holiest and most sublime god himself consulted in humility confidence and prayer few in our day imitate him and hence few comprehend him to a serious mind these words of luther are in themselves a justification of the reformation luther likewise found comfort in the friendship of respectable laymen christopher schurl the excellent secretary of the imperial city of nuremberg gave him gratifying marks of his friendship we know how pleasant expressions of sympathy are to the man who feels himself assailed from all quarters the secretary of nuremberg did more he tried to make friends to his friend he urged him to dedicate one of his works to a then celebrated lawyer of nuremberg named jerome ebner you have a high idea of my studies modestly replied luther but i have the poorest idea of them myself nevertheless i was desirous to meet your wishes i have searched but in all my store which i never found so meagre nothing presented itself which seemed at all worthy of being dedicated to so great a man by so little a man striking humility it is luther who speaks thus and the person with whom he contrasts himself is dr ebner who is altogether unknown to us posterity has not ratified luther's judgment luther who had done nothing to circulate his theses had not sent them to schurl any more than to the elector and his courtiers the secretary of nuremberg expressed his surprise i had no intention replies luther to give my theses so much publicity i wished only to confer on their contents with some of those who reside with us or near us intending if they condemned to destroy and if they approved to publish them but now they are printed reprinted and spread far and wide beyond my expectation so much so that i repent of their production not that i have any fear of the truth being known by the people for this was all i sought but this is not the way of instructing them there are questions in the theses as to which i have still my doubts and if i had thought that they were to produce such a sensation there are things which i would have omitted and others which i would have affirmed with greater confidence luther afterwards thought differently far from fearing he had said too much he declared that he ought to have said still more but the apprehensions which luther expresses to schurl do honour to his sincerity they show that he had nothing like a premeditated plan had no party spirit no overweening conceit and sought nothing but the truth when he had fully discovered the truth his language was different you will find in my first writings said he many years after that i very humbly made many concessions to the pope and on points of great importance 
concessions which I now detest and regard as abominable and blasphemous. Scherl was not the only layman of importance who at this time testified his friendship for Luther. The celebrated painter, Albert Dürer, sent him a present, perhaps one of his pictures, and the doctor expressed his sense of the obligation in the warmest terms. Thus Luther had practical experience of the truth of that saying of divine wisdom, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. These words he remembered for the sake of others also, and accordingly pleaded the cause of the whole population. The elector had just levied a tax, and it was confidently alleged that he was going to levy another, probably on the advice of his counsellor Pfeffinger, against whom Luther often throws out cutting sarcasms. The doctor boldly placed himself in the breach. Let not your highness, said he, despise the prayer of a poor mendicant. In the name of God, I entreat you not to order a new tax. My heart is broken, as well as that of several of your most devoted servants, at seeing how much the last has injured your fair name, and the popularity which your highness enjoyed. It is true that God has endowed you with profound intellect, so that you see much farther into things than I, or doubtless all your subjects, do. But perhaps it is the will of God that a feeble intellect instruct a great one, in order that no one may trust in himself, but only in the Lord our God. May he deign to keep your body in health for our good, and destine your soul to life eternal. Amen. In this way it is that the gospel, while it makes us honour kings, makes us also plead the cause of the people. While it tells them of their duties, it at the same time reminds the prince of their rights. The voice of a Christian such as Luther, raised in the cabinet of a sovereign, might often supply the place of a whole assembly of legislators. In this letter, in which Luther addresses a harsh lesson to the elector, he fears not to present a request to him, or rather to remind him of a promise, viz. to give him a new suit. This freedom of Luther, at a moment when he might have feared he had given offence to Frederick, is equally honourable to the prince and to the reformer. But, adds he, if it is Pfeffinger who has the charge of it, let him give it in reality, and not in protestations of friendship. He knows very well how to weave a web of good words, but no good cloth ever comes out of it. Luther thought that by the faithful counsel which he had given to his prince, he had well deserved his court dress. Be this as it may, two years later he had not received it, and renewed